Good evening, everybody. I'm Hans Bachwer, one of the staff members here at ANU. And on behalf of the Black Hole Society and the Australian Institute of Physics, I'd like to welcome you to today's public lecture. We have a terrific rollout, and so obviously it will be a very good lecture. And we make sure of that because, A, we have a very attractive title, but we also have a very attractive speaker. <laughs> Paul Francis. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are, have studied or are studying ANU, you probably came across Paul in the first year course. And ever since he arrived in about 1997, 98, um, he has lifted the standard of teaching even further with his enthusiasm, with crazy ideas, with new things happening in the classroom. So um, the students, many of you will know Paul, to the others, he's one of the most um, excited and exciting uh, physicists I know, particularly in this area of astronomy. So without further ado, shall we ask Paul and uh, see what the unsolved mysteries of universe are. Welcome, Paul. Okay, well, thank you for having me here. Um, normally, when you get talks about um, ast astronomy, it's all about the. What, a bit loud here, turn that down a bit. It's usually a lot about um, exciting discoveries. So you get people come up in front and say, here's the wonderful thing I've just discovered, and here's the new thing we've worked out. Um, the reason for this, of course, is that the main people, pe reason people give talks is because they want to look good and they want to persuade people to give them money. And so they always tell about the things they do know and they have discovered. And so you regularly, if you read the newspapers, for example, I think we've had seen first black hole discovered at least 25 times in the newspaper. Um, first planet discovered probably over 100 times now in the newspapers. Big Bang has been proven wrong probably about another 100 times in the newspapers. Um, so what I wanted to do was take a different tack. And instead of talking about what we do know and the big discoveries, talk about a much larger topic, which is the things that we don't know about the universe. Um, so at the end of this talk, you won't know anything more than you knew at the beginning, but hopefully you have, you hopefully have a more refined form of ignorance. <laughs> now I'm famous, um, as Hans is probably obliquely referring, for speaking way too fast in an incomprehensible pommy accent. So if I'm making no sense at all, just throw something at me and I might briefly slow down. And also, feel free to butt up with questions at any point uh, during the talk. No need to hold them all to the end. OK. So let's bring the lights down a bit. So in preparation for this talk, I went around Mount Stromberg Observatory and asked everybody what they thought were the biggest unsolved problems in astronomy. And pretty much everybody mentioned these three. Uh, what is, where did the universe come from? What is the universe made of, and is there life in space? Pretty big questions. So I'm going to talk about those three for pretty most of the time today. Not that you have the answers to any of them, but maybe a more refined form of ignorance. But also I thought we might spend a bit of time talking about some of the less famous unsolved problems of astronomy. These things are kind of famous. You can read New Scientist, Scientific American, you always see these referred to as huge unsolved problems. But here are a few mysteries you might not have heard so much about that I picked up from talking to various people around Mount Stromlo. How did black holes get so big? The mystery of the missing dwarf galaxies. The, there's an um, object out there on Pluto called Sedna, which is in an orbit that's completely impossible. Um, lack of tidal locking. A lot of stars should be pointing in a picky direction and are not, and no one knows why. Red giant stars pulse in a way that's impossible. Um, planets shouldn't exist. Oh dear, this is be living on one. Ah, oh, well, it shouldn't exist. Um, jets, not the sort of thing that you fight in America with, but the ones that get squirted out of black holes and the like. Um, and the tails of comets that point in the wrong direction. Now, that's an awful long list of ignorance, but we'll see how many we can get through, okay? So let's get started. Where did the universe come from? Now, it doesn't, doesn't really get many much bigger questions than this. I remember once I had a nightmare. I'd just been setting exam questions for my students, and I um, went to sleep, and I had this nightmare, 
and I, that I had got to the pearly gates and uh, St. Peter was standing there saying, OK, well, you've made students have so much misery over the years, you're not getting in here unless you pass an exam. And I opened the exam paper. This is the first question on it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what do we know? I'll show you a little simulation here. What we do know is that at the moment, space is expanding, carrying things apart from each other. So we have a highly sustainable simulation I wrote here to show you this. So every coloured sphere there is a galaxy, and space between them is expanding and carrying them apart. And that's what our universe looks like at the moment. Galaxies are all moving away from every other galaxy. At the moment, we still have some galaxies fairly close to our own, but as time goes on, they'll get further and further away until a few hundred billion years from now, we won't be able to see any other galaxies from where we are. So extra galactic astronomy will then stop at that point. Um, now, of course, as you see that, at the moment, everything is moving away from everything else. Presumably, that means in the past, everything was closer together. And this was the origin of the Big Bang Theory, the idea that if everything was closer, closer together in the past, then the further back you go, everything would have been even more squashed and even closer and closer. But eventually, if you go far enough back, everything will be in the same place. Big Bang! Um, this much is uncontroversial, I think. Um, it is generally believed that space is currently expanding. I think the evidence of that is pretty overwhelming. Um, and the fact that the universe was once much denser, everything was packed close together, is also pretty uncontroversial. We can actually see the leftover remains from this period. When the universe, everything was squashed together in a really close environment, say when the universe was about a second old, in that case, everything we can see in the observable universe, billions upon billions upon billions of galaxies, was squashed into about the area of my fist. So the density was absolutely enormous, everything was packed really close together, and at that point the universe was like a huge glowing fog. And you actually see the light left over from that, it's called the microwave background, and it's responsible for some of the static in your TVs and radios. So we know that the universe was indeed once very dense, very hot. In fact, I can even play you the soundtrack of this. This is what the Big Bang sounded like. below the ability of the speakers here to produce the sound. That's actually what's called acoustic oscillations or vibrations. These are vibrations of dark and light matter in the immediate aftermath of the Big Bang. And you can actually see them with your telescopes and hence reconstruct the soundtrack of the Big Bang. So we actually have a fairly good understanding of the universe probably back to when it was about a billionth of a second old. When it was about a billionth of a second old, it was an incredibly dense, it was called a, uh, a quark gluon soup, made of subatomic particles. And we kind of know what happened then, because in our biggest particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, you can smash particles together with about the same energies and densities that you had when the universe was about a billionth of a second old. So we can actually more or less reproduce what was happening back then. The trouble begins when we start asking what happened before the universe was a billionth of a second old, when it was a ten billionth of a second old, or a hundredth of a billionth of a second old, or so on and so forth. It would have been even denser, even smaller, probably even weirder. But the conditions then, the densities, the rate at which particles are smashing into each other, the sort of particles that were there, are like nothing we can do on Earth today. The Large Hadron Collider, now they've got the energy they announced, I think that they managed to boost the energy to hitherto unknown levels, I think it was today or yesterday. Um, it may have pushed it back another half a billion for a second or so closer to the Big Bang. But what was it when it was a hundred billion for a thousand billion for a million billion for a second? And the basic answer is we don't know. We can try and use our theory. We, we can't test it in the laboratory. There's no way we can reproduce the conditions in the laboratory. So that means we just have to try and use our theories. 
But there's a problem with this. There are two great theories of 20th century physics. There is relativity, which deals with very massive things, and there is quantum mechanics, which deals with very small things. Normally, you never need both. If you're going to look at you know, silicon chip, you use quantum mechanics. If you want to work out where Jupiter's going to be next week, you use relativity. But there are two situations where you need to use both, where things are both very massive and very small. You want to tell me what they are? Singularity. Singularity, yes. A black hole is one of those two cases. You have an entire collapsed star down to zero size. That's one case. And the other case, of course, is the Big Bang. The entire universe is no size. And so these two situations, you have huge amounts of mass and no size at all, and you need both quantum mechanics and relativity. And the trouble is, these two theories don't match. They don't fit at all. They're like oil and water. The, the very basis of them is quite different from each other. And so um, we probably think there is some more beautiful, deeper, better theory that combines both of them. And there are currently over 500 rival contenders for such a theory. But the trouble is, let's say uh, you come up with a new grand unified theory that combines these things. Well, let's say you do, and you do, and you do. Um, how do you know if it's true or not? Because unless we have a black hole in the lab, or a big bang in the lab, we can't test it. Quantum mechanics and relativity work perfectly well for everything we can test in the laboratory. So there are lots and lots and lots of rival theories to try and merge these two. And if you get one of these theories, then maybe you can predict what happened at the moment of the Big Bang and where the Big Bang came from. But the trouble is, we don't know which of any of these theories are right. My personal bet is that they're all wrong. Um, but at the moment, we don't know. So according to some theories, the universe can come out of itself. And some theories, you know, doesn't actually have a beginning, but sort of turns a strange corner. And all sorts of weird things like this. But basically, we don't have the faintest idea. We don't have a theory that works for that, and it's a very, very long way beyond what we could actually experiment on. As an experimental scientist, my feeling is that generally whenever you try and extrapolate well beyond what, where you can actually test things, you're asking for trouble. Um, I know many theorists who disagree with me strongly on that, people like Stephen Hawking, but my, my um, looking at the history of science, I say that whenever people have tried to just use the brilliance of the human brain to work out what's going on, and they've gone a long way beyond where the data is, the universe has always outsmarted them. But we'll see what's going on in the case here. It's interesting going to conferences where people discuss this sort of stuff, because it's, you know, I've got my theory over here. She's got her theory over there. And it becomes, and there's no data to tell which is better or which is worse. So it becomes sort of a beauty contest. Nah, nah, my theory is prettier than your theory. <laughs> so to my, my way of thinking, this is a lot like looking at how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's, it's not science. Um, and probably will, not, will remain not science. So this is why I think this is the biggest unsolved problem. Where did the universe come from? We basically don't know. We have no good theory. You might as well ask your priest or rabbi or imam. They have at least as good an idea as we do. Questions or comments about that? But the literal size of the, of the star thing, well, that, how big? OK, the question was, what's the literal size of the starting lump? Um, it's a common misconception that the Big Bang consisted of, there's once upon a time, a huge empty bit of space with a big egg. And then one day, the egg went and squirted galaxies out in all directions. I call this the exploding egg model. I've even seen it in NASA press releases. This is actually not the correct model of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is not an explosion in space, it's an explosion of space. It's space itself that's expanding. So, for example, there is more space between me and you than there was when this lecture began. Basically, if you've got a length of about a metre, it expands by about um, 100 millionth of the width of an atom every second. So this is not why it takes one to get to work every day. Um, but nonetheless, every bit of space is expanding. Um, and on small scales, like around us today, the center is far too small to notice. Um, but if you were to wait billions of years and over a huge distance, you can actually see this expansion. Uh, it's often thought to be a bit like blowing up a balloon. The balloon is a space, and let's say you put dots all over the outside of a balloon and blew it up, the dots will move apart. But it's actually not the dots that are moving, it's the space underneath that's actually doing the moving for them. Um, so what does that, how does that answer your question? We probably believe the universe is infinite today. Um, or at least very, very, very big. And so if every distance in the universe got smaller by a factor of a million, infinity divided by a million is still infinity. So according to this, the universe is now infinite and was infinite right back to the very first moment. Even a hundred billionth of a second after the Big Bang, it was you know, hundreds of billions of times smaller than now, but divide infinity by hundreds of billions and it's still infinity. What happens at the actual first moment, at which point you're dividing infinity by infinity? 
Protestant. <laughs> but at any time after, the universe would be infinite. Very dense, and every length of it was smaller than today, but it would still be infinite. Does that make sense? Uh, I'll try. <laughs> Okay, question up here. Um, with all the matter and mass, um, uh, has it been expanding or growing? Or in all that we have now, is that also present at the time of the Big Bang? Okay, the question was, is all the matter we have now, was it also present in the Big Bang? Um, this was subject of a huge debate for many decades. There were two rival theories of the Big Bang. There was the actual Big Bang theory, which said there's actually the same amount of matter now that there's always been. And so the matter is just getting more spread out. So basically the matter was created at the Big Bang. And all this happened ever since it's been more and more spread out, but there's no new matter. The rival theory was the steady state theory, which said that in fact uh, matter is being continuously created. So the matter that was there originally gets spread out and more matter comes up to fill its space, and then it gets carried apart, then more matter fills up. And that way the universe will keep on expanding but always look the same. And we now know that that is wrong, and that in fact it seems there was only a fixed amount of matter in the universe when it was, and it was born with that amount of matter, and it hasn't changed since, as far as we can tell. So the universe is getting less and less dense and more and more spread out as time goes on. Make sense? So how, much, how can that matter fit into such a you know, finite space? It yeah, well, was a good question. How can, I mean, all the matter of all the galaxies that we see fit into you the size of a peanut or something like that? Um, the answer to that is that what we think of as solid matter is actually not very solid. I mean, we are made up of atoms, um, and the atoms are, are spaced quite wide. And if you look at an atom, let's say we had an atom about the size of this room, that's where the electrons are whizzing around the outside. The nucleus in the middle would be so small you could barely see it. And then even within the nucleus, if you could zoom in on that nucleus, you'd have protons and neutrons which are made of quarks, which are getting almost like dots spread around in huge amounts of empty space. So you can't actually pack millions upon millions of atoms into the same space if you have enough pressure to do it in. So it's actually fairly straightforward. Probably the fundamental particles that everything is made of have no size, they're just points. And so you can pack any amount of them into a given space. You don't normally see that because normally these particles repel each other and that like chemical bonds and things like this, and that gives us the size that we actually have. But under the incredible pressures and temperatures just after the Big Bang, you can actually pack everything incredibly closely together. At the moment, we know no limit on how closely you can pack things in principle. Make sense? There's a question over here. When you say all the matter of the universe, um, we think it probably always was. Do you remember the sense of matter and energy being interchangeable? Because there's a... Uh, it was well known and well established that energy can create matter and matter can create energy and vice versa. Okay. Is it possible that actually the whole lot was energy at the very start and then turned into matter at various different rates and... Okay. So the question was, we talked about matter, was it always in the form of matter or could it have been in the form of energy? Um, it was probably in the form of energy. Our general belief is that when the universe is a billionth of a second old, um, it was composed almost entirely of... Um, it was actually a ma ma mix of matter and antimatter. And then when the universe is about... Um, one ten millionth of a second old, the matter and the antimatter annihilated each other. And we could easily, because normally when you get matter and antimatter, let's say I'm made of matter, you're made of antimatter, we come up and shake hands, the matter annihilates the antimatter, and the explosion from my, my hand if your hand would be enough to destroy the Earth. <laughs> um, you're not antimatter, are you? Good, good. Uh, um, so what happened then was there was a sort of orgy of destruction, and the matter and antimatter destroyed each other. And for some reason, which is not at all well understood, there was a slight imbalance of matter and antimatter. Only one part in a billion imbalance. And the slight imbalance meant that there was some matter left over. And all the rest got turned into photons, gamma rays back then. And in fact, the micro background radiation that you're seeing here and you heard on the soundtrack and it's causing static on your radio is the remains of that photons produced when the matter and antimatter annihilated each other. And to this day, for every normal particle of matter, what's called a baryon in the universe, there are one billion, 10 to the power nine, microwave background photons, which are left over from this annihilation. So it's telling you that all but one part in a billion were destroyed very early on. See, it's almost certainly this matter has changed form. It's changed from energy to matter to antimatter and back and forth, probably lots of times in the early history of the universe. But there's still the same amount of it. Um, back then. That's you, your blue shirt. Yep. So does that mean, is it true then that energy occupies the space? Um, it again depends what the form of energy is. I mean, a photon, like a gamma ray, occupies space depending on its wavelength. It might be this long or that long or very, very small. But then two of them can be in the same place at the same time. 
Um, for example, uh, let's say I'm shining a torch at you, you're shining a torch at me, the light can just go straight through the same bit of space in the middle without bothering itself. So while each individual photon of light occupies a particular amount of space, given by the uncertainty principle, you can pack lots of them into the same place at the same time. Okay, uh, we might move on to the next question. We can come back at the end if you have some more. Um, so where did the universe come from? What is the universe made of? Dark, there's pretty pictures here. Um, when you look around the universe, you see stars, galaxies, planets, people, cars, politicians, other forms of normal matter. <laughs> um, but, and for a long time, people kind of believe that what you see is what you get. That when you see what you see, stars, galaxies, planets, is what there is in the universe. However, first clues came back in the 1950s, and people were studying galaxies like this one. And they looked at things orbiting around these galaxies. We talked about disk of red gas orbiting around this one, um, some rare galaxy. Now, if something is orbiting around a galaxy, the centrifugal force pushing it away from the centre. Like, whenever you go around a corner, you're flung outwards away from the corner. So whenever anything's spinning around, it's trying to escape, and there needs to be some force pulling it towards the centre, a centripetal force, to hold it in place. In the case of a galaxy, it's normally believed the stars are spinning around, or the gas is spinning around, and it wants to just fly out into space, but it's held in place by the gravity from the galaxy. All making sense so far? What you can do is you can work out how fast this gas and these stars are moving, and therefore work out how much gravity is needed to hold them in place. All the students who've been in my first year class should be able to do that calculation now. Um, and there was a slight problem. When people did the calculation, it turned out the galaxies weigh between 10 and 100 times more than they should. You can work out how much it should weigh by the way to count the stars, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You know how much each star weighs, about 10 to the power of 30 kilograms. So you multiply the number of stars by the weight of each star and you work out how much the galaxy should weigh. And you add in some mass for gas and planets and other things like that. You should be able to work it out. But then you should work out how much gravity is needed to keep these things spinning around the galaxy. It turns out to be you know, 10 times or 100 times more. So that was the beginning of the dark matter paradox. There seemed to be something in these galaxies that you couldn't see, which is why I called it dark, um, which had mass because it was pulling things in, hence dark matter. And I think I've now summarised the entire state of human knowledge of what dark matter is. <laughs> <laughs> we can't see it and it pulls things in. Okay, we'll move on now. Um, <laughs> but it seems to be this is all every galaxy. This is my excuse to be pretty pictures of galaxies. Um, any galaxy you like seems to be spinning or moving in whatever its orbits are. They're all beautiful things. And in all cases, there seems to be much, much, much too much matter in them. So what's going on here? Well, in some sense it shouldn't be surprising that there's something we can't see. I mean, by and large, remember, we are marginally intelligent specks of life living on an insignificant planet in the outskirts of a rather boring galaxy, um, looking with rather primitive telescopes up into space. Most of these don't shine. Like, if all of you into space, none of you would shine. You would look out to start matter. The Earth doesn't shine. The Earth doesn't shine. The only reason you can see it is because it has a very nice bright sun nearby. And the light of the sun doubts the Earth into our eyes, so we can see the fact that anyone has it. If the sun wasn't here, the Earth would be completely black. So by and large, you take almost anything you can imagine, like rocks or exam papers, if you go to this audience, put up the chairs, uh, and put them in space, and they will cost you dark matter. What we know about dark matter is that it, there's a lot of it. If it was, for example, in the form of old exam papers, this is actually a question I was asked in my final undergraduate exam, what would be the observational consequences if all the missing matter in the universe is in the form of old exam papers? <laughs> it turns out this can't be the case, because you wouldn't be able to see far away galaxies, because the exam papers would fill space so well it would be opaque, and you couldn't see far enough. So it probably has to be pretty transparent, otherwise it would just block our lights, because we need very large amounts of the stuff out there. So we need something that's transparent, that weighs an awful lot and doesn't shine. Okay, now we absolutely have exhausted all human knowledge of this stuff. Um, there's one other thing we can now work out about it. If it was made of normal matter, like protons and neutrons, 
then when, just after the Big Bang, it would have been involved in nuclear reactions and would have made some different elements appear on Earth. Um, so the fact that we don't see these weirdo elements tells us that most of the star matter can't be made of normal neutrons and protons. So it must be made of something else. So we know an awful lot about what dark matter is not. Um, it doesn't shine. It's not made of normal protons and neutrons and things like this. It's very heavy and it's transparent. And that is, I think, the sum total of human knowledge of what dark matter is. Questions or comments about that? So um, when there's an anomaly between observation and uh, theory, I think there's two possibilities. One is that you haven't observed everything or something else out there, which is the, the dark matter theory. Is there any possibility that we just haven't quite got gravity sorted out yet? We know that there's a problem with gravity in quantum mechanics. Is there any chance that we just haven't tested it <coughs> or that it's not quite complete yet? The answer hasn't finished? Okay, well the, the, the question was, could it be that instead of there being this huge amount of invisible, undetectable stuff, this is the sort of thing theorists love. You invent a particle that no one can see, can never detect, just floats around and does exactly what you want. That's the theorists love this. They can publish hundreds of papers about that no one can ever prove them wrong. Um, um, but it could be that maybe we just don't understand gravity well enough. Because the whole reason we think it's there is because these things in the outskirts of galaxies are moving too fast. And the way we know they're going too fast is we use our law of gravity to work out how fast they should be moving. So if our law of gravity is wrong, then maybe we don't need any of the stuff. And this is indeed a moderately respectable theory. It's called Modified Newtonian Dynamics, or MOND. And this theory says that, in fact, gravity does not quite obey the law we think it obeys. It obeys a slightly different law. <clears throat> we know that our normal law of gravity, which is Newton's equations of gravity, work extremely well on the scales of our solar system. Because we send spacecraft all over the place, they generally arrive where we want them to, unless someone failed to convert the units from imperial to metric. And who would do that? <laughs> um, NASA, of course, did this. Um, but by and large, assuming no one stuffs up their unit conversions, spacecraft go where, they tell, where we tell them to. Um, but it could be that there's some new law of physics that only occurs on really, really big scales. For example, Newton's laws of motion were invented by Isaac Newton. 400 years ago, 200 years ago, and they work very well for things like the mass of an apple, or me on a bicycle, or something like this, which is why they lasted for several hundred years, because for, anything, for things that weigh a few kilograms, travelling at a few metres per second, they work perfectly accurately. It's only when we started getting down to things going either very close to the speed of light, or very, very small, they started breaking down. We needed new laws, in this case quantum mechanics and relativity. And so it could be that there's a third great theory of physics waiting to come that only kicks in at very big scales. That on scales of you um, 100 billion metres or 1,000 billion metres, which are the biggest things we've ever done tests on the spacecraft, our laws of physics seem to work pretty well. But maybe when we go to much bigger scales, we need some new laws of physics, just as we had when we went to very small scales, and that could explain all this. And some people believe this, um, and some people don't. So once again, we don't know about it. There is another possible clue that something weird is going on, which is that the furthest out spacecraft the humans have ever sent, Pioneer, has been showing some anomalous behaviour. It's been um, decelerating back towards the solar system faster than predicted by the laws of gravity. And, <laughs> a correct response. Um, <laughs> and nobody quite knows why. Um, for some of the other spacecraft, like Voyager, have been doing. You don't quite know what's going on. They have rockets and vents all over them. So these rockets have now been flying in space for 20 years. They could well be leaking somewhere, and that's what's caused them to move in a funny way. But Pioneer was a very simple space. It was basically a spinning oil drum with antennas stuck on the outside. And so it shouldn't really do very much. It didn't have any rockets on board to leak. It should just basically fly. And it was flying at not quite the right rate. And so that might be another sign that something funny is going on here, or it could be that someone's stuffed up in the telemetry somewhere. So there could be something weird going on here, or maybe there isn't. Another question up here? Is there an understanding of dark matter that it's evenly distributed or could it through a galaxy or could it actually be concentrated in a few spots? And I'm thinking maybe that our understanding of black holes isn't that well thought out and, and most of it could actually be concentrated in black holes and it means somehow. Okay, the question is do we know where the dark matter is? Could it all be in the middle of our galaxy? Because there is, of course, a giant black hole, Sagittarius A star, in the middle of our galaxy. We do know fairly well where it is because we can look at the orbits of stars that are close to the centre and the ones that are further and further away and therefore measure how, where the mass is to some rough extent. It turns out that most of the matter is in the outskirts of our galaxy, not in the middle. It's actually more spread out than the stars. We know the mass in the middle of our galaxy because we can see stars in loop loops around that and it's about 2 million solar masses, which is nothing like enough to predict this. 
So the mass is not all in the middle. It's mostly in the outskirts of our galaxy, again, for reasons we don't well understand. So it seems to be, whatever the dark matter is, it's spread out. Okay. So, so that means it's not in between the galaxies at all? It doesn't affect the movement of galaxies? Um, it affects the movement of galaxies because it makes one galaxy attract another one more strongly. We don't actually know how far out it goes. Basically, the further out we measure, the more we find. We can't measure it too far out because we run out of stars that are orbiting to measure how fast it's moving. We can only measure how much dark matter there is as far out as the further stars we can see. And so at the moment, we know that actually about... We measure this as galaxies in kiloparsecs. A parsec is um, three light years. A kiloparsec is 3,000 light years. Our galaxy, I'm really about eight kiloparsecs from the middle of our galaxy. We can measure dark matter out to about 80 kiloparsecs. And it, the gap is still rising out there. Um, so for all we know, it could extend that right into the deep space between galaxies. And in fact, probably does at some level. But we know it's somewhat concentrated in galaxies. If we were to check out the have no effect because it's put everything equally in all directions. It has to be concentrated a bit in galaxies, but not too much in the middle. And then we're trying to see if we spend their lives trying to map in more and more detail where the dark matter actually is. Okay, I'll take one more question. So, do these spiral galaxies, yeah, spiral galaxies, um, tend to rotate as solid bodies? Or the question do they rotate as solid bodies? Um, unfortunately, the rotation period of a galaxy is 20 million years. No one's actually seen one rotate. Um, almost certainly not. They, they rotate at different speeds, different parts of them. So, so the dark matter isn't sufficient to make them. Is it growing cubically as the way it is? No, it isn't. Um, again, people are trying to work out exactly how much. It turns out that actually in the central regions of galaxies like this, generally speaking, dark matter is not very significant. Dark matter only starts to be really important when you get to the outskirts of the galaxy because it's outnumbered by the stars in the middle. Probably, that's actually somewhat controversial. Okay, so let's go on. Same for questions. Um, dark matter is pretty bad. Um, but about 10 years ago, something even worse was discovered, which is dark energy. So we've already got the universe mostly full of this mysterious, unobservable stuff that we can't see. But it turns out, this is what our universe is made out of. 4.6% atoms, of which 0.6% is all the stars and gas we can see, and the other 4%, or even of normal matter, is missing. It's probably intergalactic gas, but no one really knows. Then you've got this dark matter, which makes up 23%. And then there's more stuff called dark energy which is definitely even worse than dark matter. Now, why do we think dark energy exists? Well, I'll show you another simulation. Now, about 10 or 15 years ago, a number of people were looking at the universe expanding. Uh, remember, let's make sure the universe expanding again. And they were trying to see whether it was expanding at an accelerating or a decelerating rate. Well, actually, what they're trying to see is how much it was decelerating. Well, we would normally expect the universe to start off with a rapid expansion, because the kick it got from the Big Bang, and then as time went on, to expand slower and slower, and then at some point, maybe, gravity would bring it to a halt. And then gravity would stop sucking all the things back together again, and the entire universe would come together, and what's either called the Big Crunch or the Gnad Gim. <laughs> Gnad Gim being Big Bang spelled backwards. Um, so people were trying to measure the, how far space is expanding now, and whether it was changing, whether it was getting far slower, how, or how, particularly how much it was getting slower. So here's what they were expecting to see. So things are expanding, but the expansion slows down, then at some point it stops, and then these things will start coming back together each, towards each other again. <laughs> okay. However, what they saw was not that. This is not what they accepted. One of the leaders of one of the two teams that discovered there were two teams who actually dislike each other quite a lot, who did this, one of which is led by Brian Schmidt, is one of my colleagues here at ANU. Um, they both give movies which they refer to one of them as the uh, the um, the Rebellion, Rebel Alliance, the other one is the Empire from Star Wars. <laughs> which one of which depends which group you have here speaking about it. Um, what they actually found was something like this. The universe started off hardly expanding at all, and then as time went on it got faster and faster. 
and talks about spending in quite a fast rate, and as time goes on, it seems to be expanding at a faster and faster accelerating rate. Which is weird, and that's not, absolutely not, what anyone expects. Um, and that led to the theory that there must be something called dark energy. What we need is a force that repels other things. Gravity attracts everything to everything else, so gravity can only ever slow the universe down. If you want to make things go away from each other faster, you need a force that repels, a push force, not a pull force. We don't know of any such force, so let's invent a new one. So we invented a new force, and we need to push things away from other things. Okay? But it's worse than that. Um, normal forces are very strong when two things are close together and weak when they're far away. So, for example, gravity. If you get two people close to each other, they have a very strong gravitational pull, move them further and further apart, the gravity comes weaker and weaker. It's called the inverse square law. But that wouldn't work for this. You need a force that actually gets stronger the further things are away from each other. So the repulsion between me and you is quite small. They're probably growing by the minute. Um, but if I put you at the other end of the universe, the repulsion will be enormous and will push us away at great speed. This is a bit of a weird force. I mean, the force that pushes rather than pulls and gets stronger when things are far away than when they're close together. And let's give it a name. And if we call it dark energy, it's called dark energy primarily because if it has energy in the title, then the US Department of Energy will fund the research into it. <laughs> um, I mean, you could just call it you know, the weird force that everyone understands that the universe expands, uh, but it doesn't sound quite so catchy. Um, we can't see it, so we call it dark, because well, it's, it's invisible mysterious force makes it go in, which we don't understand. But once again, it's in a clunky name, so dark energy sounds kind of nice. And it actually dominates the universe, it's actually more important in terms of pushing the universe around than dark matter or normal matter. And I've now summarised the entire set of knowledge of dark energy. Uh, it's good we don't know so much, it's very easy to talk about. Any questions about that? Um, if, if if um, the contracting universe was correct, do you think that would mean that space would also contract, or just the matter that's in space? Okay, the question was, if the contracting universe is correct, was it space contracting or just matter? In the standard theory, which uses Einstein's relativity, it would be space itself that was contracting, carrying the matter with it. The matter doesn't do anything by itself. It's the space that's driving it around. So it would be space itself that was shrinking. Of course, if an infinite universe shrinks, it's an infinite. But every bit of space would be shrinking, so the distance between you and me would be shrinking all the time, rather than expanding as it is at the moment. That would be what the orthodox theory says. Shut up the back. Yeah, I read somewhere that Einstein discovered dark energy and then almost immediately undiscovered it. Um, the question was, he read that Einstein discovered dark energy and almost immediately undiscovered it. That is indeed correct. Einstein used his new equations to work out what was going to happen to the entire universe back in the 1920s. And his equations said the universe couldn't just sit there. It had to either expand or shrink. And he thought, huh, expanding or shrinking the universe? What utter rubbish. And so he invented a new force that could be the universe just sit stationary, stop it either expanding or contracting. And then, about a year later, Edwin Hubble discovered the universe was expanding, and Einstein kicked himself all the way around the block and said, damn, if I had had the faith in my equations, I could have predicted that. <laughs> but the mathematical form he used, um, so-called lambda, is now one of the possible contenders for this dark energy. There are multiple contenders. There are about as many contenders as there are theorists working in the field. Um, <laughs> But it could be that Einstein was correct after all, and the, the, the fudge factor that he put in to explain the universe, he had to be a bit stronger than he thought, strong enough to actually force the universe to expand rather than the level he thought it was, which was just enough to hold the universe stationary. Okay, question here. How do you know how much there is? How do we know how much there is? Um, from a number of different observations, one thing we can do is measure how the rate of expansion of the universe is changing with time. The way you do this is you look at a certain type of supernovae, type 1a supernovae, which all explode with a known brightness once you calibrate a few things. And you measure them at various distances and you measure how much space expanded by looking at how much the light has stretched since it set out from them. And so you can actually plot a graph of expansion rate versus time over the history of the universe. That's one thing. Another thing is by looking at minute fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. Another thing is by measuring rotation of galaxies and clusters. And there are a few other techniques as well. Uh, I could give a whole lecture course about that, and in fact, I do give a whole lecture course about that. <laughs> but that's a quick answer. Okay, one more question about this, um, up the back there. You said it's weird that um, it, the, it seems to get stronger as it gets further away. 
could it actually be getting closer but in a dimension, another dimension that we're not aware of, sort of like looping around the outside of a donut kind of thing? Okay, so the idea of the question was maybe there's something weird dimensionally going on. In fact, it's not um, um, to explain this. Uh, that's as good a theory as many I've heard. Um, yeah, why not? Write <laughs> 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 it down now. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, to get published, you need to have pages and pages of mathematics in there as well. It seems to be a sort of convention in the field, unless you have 400 pages of mathematics, they don't publish your stuff. I'm sure you could work something out around it. I'll let you share a paper with me. Bye, thank you. <laughs> okay. The third big question is there life in space? Once again, the answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> The argument in favour of life in space is a very technical one known as the universe is bloody big. Um, this is a photograph of a small bit of sky, and every dot you're seeing there is a star, uh, much like our own sun. And for all we know, every one of those dots has planets orbiting it, and maybe some of those planets are suitable for life, and maybe some of them have life. And so it could be that currently in planet number five orbiting, you know, that dot there. People are listening to a lecture here, so looking at a photo taken back in our direction, I'm wondering if there's intelligent life on this dot that we're here. Now, it could be, it's entirely possible and not contradicted by any data, that every single one of those dots contains intelligent life forms orbiting around it. We're busy wondering about whether there's intelligent life here. Or it could be that none of them do. So that's a pretty big discrepancy. Um, there are lots of stars in our own galaxy. That's the nearest one, the red one in the Proxima Centaur, right? A mere four light years away. Um, we have not visited any of them. The fastest space probes known by the human race will take about 10 million years to get to the nearest star at our current speeds. So it's probably a bit beyond the scope of most people's PhD theses. Um, <laughs> so we can't visit them. Um, we now know that there are planets around most stars. We don't know if they're most like planets yet, but we probably will find out in the next few years. But is there life? In our own Milky Way, there are about one followed by 11 zero stars, 10 to the power of 11, that's 100 uh, billion stars. To put that in perspective, that's about the same as the number of blades of grass in the Australian Capital Territory. <laughs> this is why it's not very interesting discovering a new star. It's a bit like going to the beach and discovering a new grain of sand. Aha! I found a new grain of sand! No one has ever seen this grain of sand before. I named it after my mother. Oh. <laughs> Not very interesting. Um, but that's just our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, I guess it's probably something like this from that. So this is actually the nearest galaxy to our own Andromeda. And every galaxy contains about 100,000 million stars. This is the Hubble Ultrasound Field. Hubble Space Telescope spent a very large amount of time staring at one blank region of the sky. This is what it saw. And everything you can see in this image is a galaxy. Even the faintest, smallest dot and smudge is a galaxy. So, let's find a very small dot or smudge or something like that. That dot there, that dot there contains 100,000 million stars. The number of galaxies within range of our telescopes, if you extrapolate from this tiny bit of the sky to the whole sky, is about a thousand thousand million galaxies, each of which contains a hundred thousand million stars. And this is within range of our telescopes, so probably an infinite number beyond that. So the number of stars within range of our telescopes is about the same as the number of grains of sand on Earth. Uh, when I told that to the media, everyone wanted to know how, many grains, how I worked out how many grains of sand there were on Earth. This is far more interesting than the space side of it. It turns out most of the sand on Earth is in the Sahara Desert, if you really want to know. The features are relevant in comparison. Um, but yes, so there are lots of stars. So the argument for is there life in space basically boils down to with all these stars, so many stars and so many planets and so much distance, how can we possibly be so arrogant as to think that we are it? We are the only marginally intelligent life in the universe. Can you really believe that with all this real estate out there, there's no life anywhere else? Is that making sense? I mean, perhaps there aren't enough equations to get published on that argument, but it's... Uh, it seems how many people think that's a fairly good argument? Show of hands, oops, okay. Now, the rival argument is no technically as the life is really, really complicated argument. The normal belief is that you get that life got started, probably in some sort of stagnant pool, or maybe some deep vent under the ground, 
where a whole bunch of chemical reactions produced some chemical that's capable of making copies of itself, called reproduction. Once you have something that's capable of making copies of itself, evolution can then take over. So you get more and more copies being made, all slightly different from each other, and some will survive better than others, and the ones that survive will have more offspring, and so on and so forth, until you end up with highly sophisticated life forms, such as Kevin Rudd. Um, <laughs> so once you can get something that can make a copy of itself, we kind of understand that evolution can take us the rest of the way. And the biologists have got that pretty well sussed, so they understand that fairly well. The question is, how do you get to that first thing that's capable of making a copy of itself? Now, the simplest things on Earth today that can make copies of themselves are bacteria. Viruses can, but they're kind of cheap. They have to use your body to make copies of themselves, so that wouldn't do as a first form of life. Um, virus wouldn't have anything to infect. So the, the only thing that can make copies of itself, just given the into a pool of chemicals, make a copy of itself is a bacterium. And as any biologists will know, bacteria are really, really, really complicated. And so it's very, very hard to see how a random chemical reaction could produce a bacterium. As Sir Fred Hoyle once put it, um, the odds of a random chemical reaction producing a bacterium is about the same as the odds of a whirlwind blowing through a junkyard and assembling a fully functional Boeing 747. <laughs> Only in fact, it's a lot worse than that because a cell has a lot more moving parts than a Boeing 747. And so you can try to work out, you know, try this, what the odds are of this ever happening, and they come out as your 1 in 10 to the power of 30, 10 to the 40, ridiculously small odds of this ever happening. In fact, such small odds that even given all these stars and all these galaxies, you wouldn't expect there to be ever, ever to have happened. And if it has happened, it would only happen once. Us. So that's the problem here. We have, on one hand, very large amounts of space. On the other hand, incredible implausibility. How the hell do you get life forms going? Life forms are so complicated. And it's how you weigh up these two that determines whether you believe that every dot here has billions of intelligent life forms, or none of these dots have intelligent life forms. Is that making sense? Questions or comments about that? Um, but what about if um, you have a guy that um, you rely on instead of um, okay, the question was what happens if uh, God comes into it and God can certainly do anything he or she likes. Um, if God is coming into this, then I think science gets out of it, um, which may not be a bad thing. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm if, you have, if, if you believe that, uh, then, then it comes to the issue for theologians rather than scientists. Do you think that it's in God's interest to populate all these dots with life or not? And that would probably depend on which religion and which priest you had and so on and so forth. But certainly if that was how this thing happened, um, yeah, all bets are off scientifically speaking, it becomes a realm for theology rather than a realm for science. There's no connection that, that you know between the two that are getting too close to science and God? The question was, is there a connection between science and God? Um, this is a very dangerous question. If I were to venture into this topic in America, I'd probably get burnt at the stake. Um, I think it's a bit safer in Australia. Uh, I personally don't think there's much of a connection. I personally think that science tells you about things you can observe and measure, and religion's only to me telling you about moral things. And uh, science hasn't, well, hasn't gone into any moral issues. Uh, science can tell you how many stars there are and how they're moving, but it can't tell you why they are there. Um, it can't tell you how you should live your life or anything like that. Um, there is a possible conflict when religion gets onto factual matters, like saying the world was created in 4004 BC, or that. Um, so, if you have a very literal view of religion and it starts stating that the universe is this age, then science can conflict with it. But I think most religious people do not believe that. They believe it's much more a moral imperative. There's no particular conflict. I don't think they really talk to each other. They talk about different things. In my personal opinion, um, but. Uh, uh, if we start seeing signs for miraculous intervention, like life that appeared with no reason, that would, I think, be very good evidence for the existence of some deity. Question up here. Um, when you talk about life, and uh, you basically um, uh, replicating, um, replicating um, something that replicates itself, something yes. Replicate, but that's just the basis that uh, we're using for life, right? What, what if there are some other base for life? Um, Okay, the question is, am I actually too narrow in my definition of life? I'm referring to life as a replicating old thing. Um, the reason I use replication as a definition of life is because evolution is an incredibly powerful way of generating complicated life forms. And nobody knows any way of generating anything as sophisticated as us without the use of evolution. Either, or either evolution or God said, let them be sophisticated. Um, 
So I current understanding is that we can't get we can maybe get very basic life forms without replication, but a systematic life form one which might have a conversation with will need evolution to make it complex enough to be worth having a conversation with and to have evolution need replication. That being said, it might well not be based on carbon compounds, it might be some strange energy life form or something quite different. Um, but as far as we know, the only way to produce things with complicated disasters is evolution or direct creation. Um, could it be that the simplest things that can replicate right now are bacteria simply because life has existed for you know, a couple of uh, thousand million years, but back then when life started, simpler things existed that have been wiped out since? Okay, the question was, at the moment, bacteria are the simplest things that can replicate themselves. Or maybe there were some simpler things back in the past. And that is the what most people think. Um, what we do know is that on Earth, life got going pretty well as soon as it could. In fact, even before the Earth's surface was fully solidified, there were life forms on Earth. And that kind of indicates that they got going pretty easily. And so it could well be there is some much simpler form of life, much simpler than any bacteria today, that actually can quite easily form by some random chemical reaction, which then evolved into bacteria. And these simple things have now have been wiped out, the bacteria ate them for breakfast. Um, but there was still this very simple thing around very early on. One contender is actually RNA. RNA floats around inside our cells, but actually is capable under some conditions of replicating itself outside of cells. And so it's actually possible that there was originally, a lot of belief that there was originally an RNA world, which eventually developed cell membranes and turned into cells. Uh, prions are other possibilities. These are actually proteins that can meet up with other proteins and fold them into particular shapes by special chemical reactions. The most famous example is mad cow disease, which explains my lecturing style. Um, <laughs> and you know, grew up in England in the 80s. Um, and so it's possible that actually some of the, the early life forms were actually um, prion based. So I think what most biologists would say now is that in fact there is a much easier way to get life started. We don't know what that way is at this point, um, but it probably involves something much simpler than a current bacteria that's capable of making copies of itself. We don't know what that is. It may be RNA. A lot of people are trying to work out what, it, what the possibilities are. And the fact that life got going so very early on is kind of a clue that, that might be the case. Okay. Um, is there life on our own solar system? Or most things we see on our own solar system look like this. Anyone know what this is? Saturn's moon. This is uh, our moon, the Earth's moon, taken from a rather strange angle by the moon perspective spacecraft. Um, places like this are probably not good places for life. Hard vacuum, intense heat and radiation, no water. Um, the big planets, like this is Jupiter with its good iron in the foreground, these are made of gas, huge slowly clouds of gas, and there are actually some altitudes in the clouds of Jupiter which might be quite hospitable for life. So you might imagine some sort of strange floating sort of jellyfish creams floating around in the upper atmospheres of these things. The radiation is so intense that it would be pretty tough though. Um, the best contender for life is probably this place, Mars. Um, this is a lush region of Mars. Um, <laughs> Uh, it doesn't look too promising at the moment, but in the past it probably had water. Here are the really weird shapes. You'll see this picture of what's really pretty on the show. It's nothing to do with the talk. This is a view of part of Mars, and these weird swirling patterns are actually probably where uh, twisters, you know, whirlwinds, moved across and cleared off the dust from the surface, leaving a darker layer underneath visible. Um, but Mars at the moment is very cold and very dry, but it could have been possible, but it's probably the best possible contender for somewhere else where it could be life in our own solar system. Okay, on some of the other questions quickly in the last couple of few minutes. How do black holes get so big? There's a type of black hole known as a quasar, which is a, a mass artist's impression of, which live in the middle of galaxies, and they weigh between 10 and 1,000 million times the mass of the sun. Huge clouds of gas swirl down their throats and glow really intensely before being swallowed into the black hole in the middle. And they squirt jets of material at very, very close to the speed of light out for no reason to understand in both directions. Um, and this is warp interaction. Photograph of one of these things taking the whole space also. Um, here are some pictures I personally have taken um, of two of these things. That dot there, a bit overexposed, is a giant black hole, a quasar. It's 10.3 billion light years from the Earth. So the light was travelling to hit our telescopes since twice as long ago as when the Earth formed. Um, this one over here, the blue dot, is an even more distant one. The puzzle is, 
These things are very massive. They shine by tearing apart stuff around them. The stuff around them gets ripped to pieces, it glows like crazy. But we now see a lot of these giant black holes all the way back to just after the Big Bang, even within 10% of the age of the universe, and they're incredibly massive. How do they get this massive? And you might think this is the problem. Black holes get massive by eating things. That's what black holes do, isn't it? They eat things. They suck things in. Everyone's seen a Disney movie, The Black Holes, which was quite a long time ago. Everything gets swallowed by a black hole, and the black hole would all be sucked into it, it would be doomed. In fact, the problem is the reverse. Black holes are not good enough at sucking things up. They are very inefficient vacuum cleaners. I mean, let's imagine it's another highly sustained simulation. Um, there we have a black hole, and let's, um, let's change the direction of this. Let's have a black hole, and we're going to have a space craft near it. Okay, there's a black hole, and you see what happens to the space craft. The gravity sucks it in. Bye-bye. <laughs> And let's imagine the space is trying to escape. So let's give it a starting velocity in this direction, see if it can escape. We'll give it, say, a whopping starting velocity, so my computer code here, let's get it going at, um, oh, my, that's a black hole, one hole. Um, the release. Here we go. So let's give it a speed of 400,000 meters per second. Get away from the black hole. Let's see if it can say. Oops. <coughs> so now it's trying to escape from the black hole. Sure enough, the black hole's gravity. Sucks it back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, oh no, man, he was, look. So, so far, black holes are living up to their reputation, they suck things in. The trouble is that most things trying to avoid a black hole won't try and run straight away from it. I mean, if you see it, you're charging rhinoceros came in the door here, I'm sure hands got one hidden outside, and I run this way, it's all black without running it. If I was a black hole over there, running this way is not a good idea. If I run this way, a right hand, however, I have a much better chance of escaping. So let's change our direction by 90 degrees. <coughs> so what happens if we're moving sideways? Here's what happens. A black hole sure enough sucks you in. But in fact you go into an orbit around it, an elliptical orbit around the black hole. And this orbit will repeat itself indefinitely. So even a very small sideways velocity keeps you out of the mouth of a black hole. It's a bit like a rips in the ocean current. You swim sideways, don't try to swim against them. That's exactly the same thing applies to black holes. Here's a black hole, thank you for telling me this. <laughs> and this poses a problem. This is one of the many unsolved mysteries of space. Um, Virtually everything in the universe has sideways motions. All the matter is in galaxies that spin, um, stars that spin. How can you possibly get enough matter to fall into a black hole to make it 100 million times the mass of the sun when everything's moving sideways? And we don't know. As far as I can tell, it's completely impossible. Nothing should fall into a black hole. A black hole should never have got as big as they have. Uh, we don't know how to make black holes as big as early. We know that within 10% of the age of the Big Bang, massive black holes in the pit are somehow a lot of matter got into one place. But we can't see how you do it. We have no idea. So that's one puzzle. I think the time I might try and squeeze in one or two quick more puzzles to stop the questions. Pulsing giant stars. This is a picture of um, I think this is Betelgeuse. Giant stars, red supergiants, like our sun will turn into in five billion years' time, look something like this. They're rather fuzzy, and they pulse. In, out, in, out, in, out. And for a long time, people thought they understood this pulsing. They could understand the physics of how these things pulse in, out, in, out. But they discovered that 20% of these things pulse wrong. They do all the normal pulsing, and in addition, they have a much slower pulse in, out, that can't be explained by any theoretical model. The world authority on that is my colleague Peter Wood at Mount Strong, and he's been spending his life on understanding this pulse for at least 20 years, has come no closer to an answer. It's completely impossible to what happened. But it does. 
Another question, where are the dwarf galaxies? This is a, you know, a simulation of the formation of a Milky Way galaxy. Quite a violent process. Blobs of dark matter and galaxies crashing into one another, forming thing in the centre. And if you look at that, you'll see that at the end, the galaxy in the middle is surrounded by swarms of tiny little dots, dwarf galaxies. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, should be surrounded by about 500 little baby galaxies. Instead, it's surrounded by about 10 baby galaxies. So 490 of them are missing. This is another pretty big problem. My colleague Helmut Jordan spends his life trying to solve this. Where are all the missing galaxies? Oh, dear, we've lost most of them. Why can the planets fall into the sun? Our standard theory of how the solar system formed is that there's a spinning disk of gas, one of these inexplicable jets squirting out the top and bottom. And originally it was composed of huge numbers of rocks. So you can see there. The rocks eventually stuck together, small rocks hit into bigger rocks, hit into even bigger rocks, hit into even bigger rocks, and end up things the size of combi vans smashing each other, then things the size of houses smashing into each other, things the size of black mountains smashing into each other, kept on smashing one into another, until it'll end up with very big rocks like Earth, Mars, Venus. That's the orthodox theory of star formation. There is one problem with it. These rocks were originally orbiting inside a spinning gas cloud. There would have been friction between the gas and the rocks. The friction should have caused the rocks to spiral into the sun in a much shorter time scale than needed to form the planets. So planets can't form. Sorry, Earth, you can't exist. Go away. <laughs> why, did this, why did this happen? We don't know. How did Sekhle get into its orbit? Here's a map of our solar system. You look at inner planets in the top left. Zoom out to the outer planets. And zoom out once more, and you can see that there's this really weird object called Sedna in a very elongated orbit. At the moment, it's pretty much its closest encounter to the solar system. It's about um, two, just over twice as far out as Pluto is. That's its closest encounter. Um, it will take um, many thousands of years to go around each orbit. There are almost certainly hundreds more like it, most of which are currently at their furthest point in their orbit, so they can't see them. Um, and this orbit is impossible. I mean, it's quite possible in terms of it obeys all the laws of physics. It's how did it get into it? Normally, the idea is things in weird orbits like this get into weird orbits because they have a close encounter with something like Jupiter and that squirts them into a funny orbit. The trouble is, for that to happen, the orbit must come close to Jupiter at some point in its orbit. This orbit never comes close to anything at any point of its orbit. So it can never have had a close encounter to put it in this orbit. So at the moment, we have absolutely no idea how Sedna got into the orbit, or all the other ones like it that we haven't yet discovered. It shouldn't exist. But it does. And finally, I'd like to talk about some of my own research. This is a simulation of comets coming through the solar system. Orthodox theory. If you believe comic shows like The Simpsons, comets have tails that drag behind them. I think this is because people confuse comets with shooting stars. If you read your textbook, it will tell you that, in fact, comets have tails that don't point behind them. They point away from the sun, which is what the simulation is doing. So the tail of the comet is dust rays and emitted from the nucleus of the comet, and they're pushed away like pressure from the sun, and they produce a tail that points away from the sun. That's the orthodox theory. Let's <coughs> um, that slide. However, I've been recently observing a whole bunch of comets when they are a long way out beyond the orbit of Saturn. The picture on the top left is actually an image of one of these comets, and the boxes on the right are computer simulations. And it turns out the tail of this comet neither points behind the trail nor away from the sun. It actually points in a different direction. What you can see in the movie simulations is I try a whole range of different models. Um, by changing the dust waves up, the movie showed all different possible theoretical models, and he said none of them look at all like the actual comet. So I can't explain that. So, to conclude, there's actually quite a lot left to discover in astronomy. We haven't actually quite finished the field yet. Um, there are some pretty big questions we do not know the answers to. And in fact, there are probably some pretty big questions we will never know the answer to. And in fact, the one thing that really worries me is that astrophysics is actually still very common sense compared to physics. Anyone here who's ever studied quantum mechanics will know that it is seriously weird stuff. Uh, 
I mean, really seriously weird. Most bits of physics you study, if you study them eventually, ah, it makes sense. Quantum mechanics, that never happens. <laughs> you get used to it after a while. Oh, yes, of course, things can be in the same place at different times. And, oh, yeah, that's fine. You get used to it, but it never, never makes sense. And this also applies to people who invented it. It never made sense for them. They got used to it, they can use it. Every, every computer in the world uses quantum mechanics. We're very good at using it, but it doesn't make sense. It's very weird. It's very much against the way our brains work. Whereas well, most things in astrophysics seem to make sense. You know, objects move around, they behave in normal ways. It all seems very common sense, just like behaviour on Earth on a bigger scale. And that worries me a bit. It worries me because we actually know sod all about anything in space. We're just stuck here on this little dot called the Earth, staring away at the huge distance. And it could well be that these things up there are very, very much weirder than we think. And the only reason we think we understand them is because they... Um, because of our ignorance. If we actually get up close to them and measure them the same way that we can measure what's happening in some quantum mechanical system, we start discovering that everything we see in space is a whole lot weirder than we think it is. Thank you very much.